we're in the Museum of Modern Art, and we're on the fourth floor in the rooms devoted to abstract expressionism, and we're standing in front of Mark Rothko's number three slash number 13, which dates to 1949. <laughs> Those abstract expressionists love to not name their paintings. In fact, it's sort of a modernist problem. It I is. Think. It is. And, and Composition number blah. Well, they didn't want to close down meaning. I right? understand. It's, <laughs> but, but, that ambiguity is incredibly important for artists in the 20th century. It is. But I think that the weird number 3, number 13 part, I, I wonder if that has to do with the curators trying to figure out really what this thing was called and not being sure about it. Yeah, you, that could be <laughs> I have no idea, actually. You know, it's it's interesting because Rothko is an artist that even even at a time when I was a little bit put off by abstract painting, I always loved the Rothkos. They're, they they have a kind of brooding heaviness about them that a I think gorgeous I gorgeous melancholy. Yeah, right? gorgeous and I, melancholy. yeah, and I don't think I even knew why it made me feel that way. I think Rothko would have been really really happy to hear you say that. I think Rothko really wanted people. In fact, I seem to remember a quote where he said, "If people understood his paintings, they would be in." years before them. Yeah, I think yeah. it did that to yeah. me. Yeah. There's something wonderfully sort of solemn and almost kind of feeling you sometimes get when you look at stained glass windows in a Gothic cathedral. Mm -hmm. yeah, there's something incredibly sort of awesome there about is. them in and, the old-fashioned sense. And so what is it that evokes those feelings, really? You know, it's it's a lot of things. It's, these, it's the horizontality. It's the uh, way that the forms are sort of behind and in front and have no edges and kind of hover. Until you said no edges and hover, it sounded like you were talking about a Mondrian. Yeah, um, but, but also there's, there's that kind of way that you can see underneath the paint and, you know, sometimes it, com it comes in front. It's, it's, there's a kind of incompleteness and A kind of finding. It. It's a process, yeah. right? You can feel almost Rothko's efforts to find his way through this. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there's Now you sound like we're talking about a Cezanne. Oh, that's interesting. But I think there, there are elements of Cezanne and Mondrian here, which is not what you would think of at first. No. I think that these are paintings that, as you were saying that, you were moving your hands back and forth. And I think that this is exactly right. It took me a while to figure this out about Rothko, but I think that these are paintings that are about space rather than color. I mean, color is important, obviously, and color is gorgeous. These are forms, these almost clouds of forms mm -hmm. that exist in some sort of space of their own construction. That makes sense. It's interesting when you said the horizontality, because they're, they are horizontal paintings, even though yeah, in fact, a vertical the, image. the canvas yeah. is vertical, yeah. Yeah. but they create an Occupy space in a very important way, and the heaviness of that black form, that sort of cloud of black rectangle, it's soft so in its edges, ominous. It's, and, and because it's high, its center of gravity is ever more powerful. Mm -hmm. Do you see what I mean? Well, it, I feel like it almost pulls me into it. It does, right. Is Absolutely. that what you mean? Yeah, yeah. well, I think so, but it also presses down mm -hmm. vertically on the cream white below the line of dark blackness below that and the green below that. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. There's a it's kind of, oppressive. There's this kind of incredible luminosity that exists here. But actually, according to some conservators, Rothko's colors have lost a lot of their edge. And I wonder what they would have looked like, uh, even been more luminous. They're very vivid. So this notion that one's not after a sort of finished product, but that these are process-oriented paintings. You know, the famous term that Rosenberg used was action painting. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't usually think about that term in relationship to Rothko, because because there's a kind of centrality and a kind of balance that's so Well, and when you think of action, you think about Pollock, Pollock yeah, you know, of leaning over the But thing. I think that there is a kind of provisionalness and a kind of process of finding, I think you're absolutely right, which is very much tied to the artist and his experience in the making of this canvas. And I think that the authenticness of the canvas can really be embedded in that notion. Of finding, of the finding, artist exploring. And finding and feeling, yeah. Mm -hmm. I think that that's exactly right. You know, it's interesting because... So there's then, a kind of turn toward the psyche. Yes, this is exactly right. This is an expression of the interior. What's sort of funny is that in the next generation, some artists will begin to well, dis disavow that. rejection yeah. of that. Right, because this is seen as a kind of psychoanalytic heroicism growing out of the European surrealism, mm -hmm. etc., um, growing out of Jung, out of Freud, but in a kind of purely American idiom at a kind of American scale, the sort of grandeur um, and space. Right, so you use Warhol as a kind of reaction yeah, to the, absolutely. the soup cans. Yeah, absolutely. Or, or Rauschenberg or even, mm -hmm. even Jasper that Johns. Art that sort of statement that art is about is and not about some kind of inner psychic state, right? But, these, but this is in, in some ways a very beautiful and expressive kind of romanticism in that way, isn't it? I think so. Yeah. yeah.